it's sad to say though, it takes um, events like this or things that happen like this to realize how good, good human beings can be. You know, when, when, you, when you have these types of things involved in your life, you, you see the good in people. Ghost Cult Magazine is honored to welcome in Mark Tremonti. Mark, how are you today? Good. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. We're really appreciative to chat with you. This is wonderful. Thank you, man. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so much to unpack and so much stuff going on. Obviously, we're here to talk about Tremonti Sing Sinatra, this wonderful record. But really in conjunction with this record is a wonderful initiative that personally I'm equally jazzed about to the music. I don't know that many people will say that. Uh, I am not only a huge Sinatra ophile, and I was studying musicology, and I grew up on jazz and saw Frank Sinatra in concert, but also this is a really has a really wonderful awareness raising and charity element to it that is very near and dear to my heart. As the uh, my late brother had autism, I was very involved growing up in activism for the handicapped and charity awareness and raising. So this is hits me on a lot of levels personally as well as professionally. Awesome. Well, I'm glad I'm glad you're helping spread the word about it then. That's great. Yeah, absolutely, man. And uh, you know, just first really with, before anything, this where this really begins is you per, uh, kind of a personal mission for you, your daughter. It's it's very personal to you and really uh, you know, obviously on a on a tremendous level, you could do a lot of things with your time and your musical career, but this is really very special. Absolutely. You know, about three years ago, I became obsessed with singing like Frank Sinatra for some reason, just like when I was a kid trying to play guitar like other players. I did the deep dive and like just I want to sing like Frank Sinatra just for fun. And then years later, I'm like, I felt pretty good about it. I just didn't know what I was going to do with it. So um, when we got the diagnosis that when my wife was pregnant, that our daughter was was going to be born with Down syndrome, um, I had read all the Frank Sinatra books and, and read something that I didn't know that he, he had raised over a billion dollars for charity. And people don't talk about that, which is a shame. Um, so I thought, why not record a record, do it for charity, raise funds and awareness for Down syndrome. My daughter's going to have Down syndrome. I'm going to be this. I'm going to be a, hopefully a champion of the cause and do everything I can to, to dive in and help people through this situation. And uh, yeah, she's always, she's always right here next to me during my interviews. <laughs> Wonderful, man. That's beautiful. That's really beautiful. Uh, you know, we've come a long way in, in you know, 50, 60 years where yes. I remember when my parents, you know, they didn't know what was wrong with my brother, uh, you know, who passed on quite a while back, but, you know, obviously not from, uh, you know, anything else except a, a, an illness that had nothing to do with, you know, his own issues. But, you know, they didn't know just didn't know parents, you know, were dismissed and pediatricians, doctors, they just didn't know. And then yeah. over time, you know, I, I'm so very thankful for the science and the scientific community and even the government who gets a very bad rap today, but, you know, they were leading the forefront and trying to, you know, get to the bottom of these things and give hope and, and comfort to parents who just didn't know, you know, it's a very scary thing to have a, a child and not know what what's going on with them. Yeah, you know, like you said, it's just thank thankfully this is happening into this this day and age because even 20 years ago, a child with Down syndrome wouldn't be um, allowed to have the open heart surgery my daughter just had. You know, they would they would die at an earlier age because um, these surgeons should be working on people without Down syndrome instead. You know, it's just a shame because it's um, you meet these beautiful human beings with Down syndrome and you just want to do everything you can for them. And for them not to be able to reach their full potential or have the rights to be as healthy as anybody else in this world is, is just in, in, insane to me. So, um, you know, and it's one thing when I when we found out that she had Down syndrome, I was afraid. I was scared. I didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't know. Um, I didn't grow up with anybody with Down syndrome. I didn't have any friends or anybody with close relatives with, with Down syndrome. That I that I was in contact with, so I didn't know what to expect. But my wife grew up with a cousin with Down syndrome that she was with every day, so she wasn't afraid at all. She was just excited to have a child. So I thought this was going to be a lonely, tough existence. But once you get into the Down syndrome world, it's such a huge support group. You make more friends than you'd ever have in your life because everybody's looking out for one another. And it takes, you know, it's it's sad to say though, it takes um, 
events like this or things that happen like this to realize how good, good human beings can be, you know, when, when you, when you have um, these types of things involved in your life, you, you see the good in people. That's wonderful, man. And again, my, you know, my, just my heart goes out to you and your family and your wife and everybody and your, and your daughter. Uh, you know, this is not a death sentence. There's still a tremendous stigma about the handicapped of all stripes and just, you know, so many challenges as a parent or a sibling or just a caregiver. You know, my heart goes out to everybody. This is just a, you know, it's, it's not, it's not grim. And obviously your daughter's had other healthcare issues, but, you know, just like, you know, the misunder, just the, just people are misinformed. And I want to give a personal shout out to the National Down Syndrome Society for the work that they do. And as well as you, you, for what you're doing with the Take a Chance for Charity, uh, you know, just this entire operation is amazing. Because again, there's so many directions you could do that, like you said, you were concerned it was going to be lonely, but there is a tremendous community around this that will you know support you forever and that's really amazing absolutely yeah it's just a huge community of, and uh you know i want to do our best part to open people's eyes to that and uh you know because it is a responsibility it is you know my my daughter's in therapy right now she goes to therapy every day um and that's because we want her to reach her full potential because she has different uh, obstacles that she's she's got a um you know she's got a a lot of folks with Down syndrome have a tough time communicating, speaking. Um, so she goes to speech therapy two or three times a week, you know, and I'd, I'd hate to see a family not have the opportunity to, to have those, um, you know, have, have, have exposure to that. So hopefully we can help with all aspects of getting, getting uh, everyone with Down syndrome a chance to thrive. That's amazing. And then on top of this really, you know, just amazing cause and and all the work you're doing we have this record that is just unbelievable uh i gotta say i'm not just not just lip service this record is phenomenal you have done a wonderful loving job paying tribute to frank sinatra kind of a a bit underappreciated it seems these days as great a name as he has and as tremendous and iconic as he was as an entertainer I, i don't know how many people have you know, a million gold records and an Academy Award and raised a billion dollars for charity. It's a very short list, I'm sure. Oh yeah, and been Uh, over 55 movies on top of it. Right, and, and, you know, stepped out of his comfort zone and did a lot of things. Uh, You know, Frank is very underappreciated and really what people don't realize is I was having this conversation with somebody else recently who interviewed me, uh, which was fun because I don't get interviewed a lot. I do the interviews. And I said, you know, what you don't realize, you know, from just kind of a musicology standpoint is the music that's popular at the time comes from a place and then it becomes popular for whatever reason. It gets commercialized or just grows in acceptance because it's great. You know, Frank Sinatra at one point was the biggest star in the world in music and his yeah. vocals and the music that he made, especially once he transitioned away from his early pop and big band stuff, was really iconic and really changed the world with his singing style, which is what people don't talk a lot about. Well, I think people don't understand before Frank Sinatra, um, the, the singer was not the band leader. They weren't the focus of the band. You had, uh, when he first started out, he played with Harry James. The trumpet player was the leader of the band. The vocals wouldn't come in until three quarters through the song. And it was just a little part. It was just a featured instrument. It was not a, it was not the, the narr- it wasn't the leader. Uh, then he played with Tommy Dorsey, same thing. But as he played with Tommy Dorsey, um, there's gr- a great picture of him playing with Tommy Dorsey, where Tommy Dorsey's this iconic band leader. He's like the, um, who's the biggest star in the world today and touring? I don't know. He's, he was the, the Beyonce or the <laughs> whoever it is. He's the he BTS was, of today. Yeah, he, he was really the guy. was. Yeah. And he, he had hired Frank Sinatra to sing with him. And there's a great picture of him playing with Tommy Dorsey where every eyeball in that crowd is looking at Frank Sinatra and not a single other person in that band. And it, it just showed it was a shift. I think he was the guy that that caused the shift to the singer, the human voice as being the main instrument that people were um, tuning into. Uh, and I think Frank Sinatra was that guy. I think Bing Crosby started that process but but frank sinatra was the guy that that sealed it right on i i would say only two other people can be on that mount rushmore in that aspect and that's louis armstrong who was also a trumpeter and yep. ellie fitzgerald so you know it's yeah. a very uh, maybe billy holiday it's a very tight class yeah, of absolutely. some of the best people to ever do it so you know frank doesn't get enough credit and a lot of things today in popular music 
come from the music that Sinatra made in the 40s and 50s. I cannot understate this. I know rockers are not supposed to like Frank Sinatra because he hated rock and roll. He was very jealous of Elvis and the Beatles because he kind of waned there for a minute and then made a comeback. So, you know, it's cool to like Sinatra. Trust me, everybody. It's cool. He's the greatest. So, yeah, man. And what I'm really impressed with, again, not just your vocal performance, which is out of sight, is this, again, this care that you took to make this record with Frank's orchestra, the arrangements, some of your own personal vocal takes are unbelievable. The artwork, every single aspect of this record is really what I would call really true. It's not like fanning out. It's like you took the care to make this thing right. Thank you very much. You know, I did my absolute best to um, do, do all my homework and pay my respects. You know, I bought the suit. I took out the earrings. <laughs> you know, I tried, you know, my, my manager, he kind of warned me. He's like, these guys these guys are some serious musicians. These guys don't, uh, you got to mind your P's and Q's and get in there and do your job right. So I went in there, you know, knowing my stuff frontwards and backwards, I, I practice this stuff more than I practice anything in the world. And, um, you know, playing with these guys was an honor. And I wanted to tell them that, I, you know, I appreciated that, that opportunity. Right on. Now I know everybody knows you for your amazing rock and heavy metal guitar playing, but I didn't know if you had any experience with jazz at all in your life. Uh, I wasn't familiar if that was something you had done. Cause again, jazz guitar, like jazz vocals, really difficult. Yes. Yes. No, jazz guitar is, uh, you know, since I was, since I was younger, I was always very interested in it and I would, I'd always dive in for a month or two and then get kind of blown out by like, I can't learn this. It's too much, too heady. Um, there's not a lot of instant gratification when it comes to playing jazz guitar. You cannot sit down and see something and master it quickly, you know? So it's, uh, it takes a lifetime of work. So a lot of people said, do you wish you could have played guitar on this record? Of course, I wish I could have played guitar, but there's no way I could have in that amount of time. And I don't want to, you can't sing these songs like Frank Sinatra did it and play the guitar. It's impossible. You know, Frank Sinatra phrased his vocals like an instrument. It's its own instrument. It doesn't play. It doesn't sing along with another instrument. It is. It is its own instrument. Um, and he never sang the same way twice. So he was always improvising on his voice. And you can't have that mental capacity to do that on two instruments at the same time. Right on. Of course. Uh, I, uh, anyone who does it, my hat. I doff my my hat to you. Uh, probably John Pizzarelli. It's a short list. Again, uh, there's not a bunch of people who can do this. And another thing that fully impressed me about this record, listen, Frank has a song catalog, especially the capital years that are just untouchable. So many hits, so many songs that are in the popular lexicon of music that it's difficult to cover them because they're so well known. But I want to shout out that you covered three songs that are not particularly hugely popular. And that's going to be uh, I fall in love too easily. Wave, which is phenomenal, one of the best songs ever, also, and the Nancy song, the Nancy with the laughing face, because those yeah, are not yeah. super well known cuts, but they're yeah. wonderful tracks, man. Well, thank you very much. You know, we also dug into, uh, you know, the song is you and all or nothing at all are. If you're a fan of Sinatra, those are very common songs. But a modern uh, music fan of Sinatra probably don't don't know those songs either. Doesn't know those songs either. Um, the song is used probably my favorite song on the entire record because that's the song that got me into singing like Frank Sinatra. That's the song I sing to my daughter every day to make her smile. So that's that's it. That's my number one. That's wonderful. So now just to, obviously the obvious question is like what kind of transition is that for you to go from, you know, fronting your own band to this completely different other genre? You rarely get to talk about this because I know there's a lot of people who can cross genres, but this is really unique in terms of your voice. Yeah, I mean, as far as singing it, I feel very, I feel great about singing it. I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm more meant to sing this style of music than I'm meant to sing rock music. You know, it's, it's my voice is strained when I'm doing rock. I'm, I'm putting grit on it and I'm screaming to hit the notes. But the Sinatra vocal styling is, is more of like my speaking voice. It suits me more nat naturally better, you know? So as far as fronting the project, I've yet to see what that's going to be like. Um, I'm I'm not going to pretend to be like Frank Sinatra on stage. I'm gonna I'm gonna try to sing as well, you know, as close to, to how he did it. But um, as far as the act, I'm not doing a Vegas act. Um, I'm gonna be myself up there because I I did my homework and I watched a bunch of different performers perform these songs live to see if I had any ideas. Because um, one of the things I worry about is every one of these songs, pretty much, other than a, a handful 
have a big gap of 30, 40 seconds in the middle where you have the trombone solo or the flute solo or whatever it is where I'm just sitting up there, hey, you know, doing this. Um, that's, the, that's what I'm mostly worried about. People might think it's silly, but when you're just standing up there with a microphone for 40 seconds while the band's doing something, who knows what the hell's going to happen? <laughs> you you might feel a little naked without a guitar. I got to be honest. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and uh, you know, again, Frank was no slouch, and you know, I, I know the you know every band I love to say starts out as a covers band. Everybody starts out covering a song. That's how you begin to learn an instrument, vocally or otherwise. But this is a lot more than that. This is really a very you know, a very fitting tribute. Uh, you don't get a lot of modern tributes to Frank. We had tributes in his lifetime, like the duets albums, which were amazing. Mm -hmm. And obviously a lot of people, again, some of these songs live in the songbook. There are famous versions of some of these songs by other artists who are equally, you know, in the Sinatra class. But the, again, to me, that's the most, maybe the most impressive thing beside the, the attempt and the singing is just to tackle some of these are the best known songs ever. You know, it's kind of like playing in Ozzy's band. You have to be perfect. Everybody knows every note, you know? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I tried to do my best to, to pay them as, as much respect as I could, you know? And, um, you know, the, the approach we had was to do half the record the way Frank Sinatra would have done them, keep the arrangements the way he would have done them. We actually used some of the arrangements that he used. Um, but for the other half of the record, um, you know, the, like the Sinatra estate wanted to hear different versions of these songs. They don't want to hear... Um, they don't want a Sinatra song to start and they people expect to hear Frank, but they hear somebody a little off and be like, ah, no, I want to hear Frank instead. So they wanted like, especially with my way. Um, I didn't necessarily want to do my way on this record. I didn't want to do the obvious tracks, but I love it so much. Uh, I was like, all right, let's do my way, but let's do it completely different. Let's take a nylon string guitar and let's make that the, make it, make it a more somber, slower, more emotional if you could be any more, you can't be any more emotional than Frank Sinatra's My Way, but a more emotional uh, approach to the music, more gentle, you know, uh, the softer ballad uh, style of, of My Way. So we did that on My Way. We took um, The Song Is You and All or Nothing At All and made them swing versions. We took I Fall In Love Too Easily and added a rhythm section to it. Um, we took We Small Hours, you know, a song that's a very sad you know love song heartbreak song and put a swing bridge in it you know so it's we did our best to 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 spice things up and stay true to the originals as well right on i love that swing bridge uh gives it a little lift that's not actually in the original or that yeah. particular version that everyone knows you know it's mm -hmm. tempting to say original but again we're talking about jazz standards in a lot of yeah. Yeah, cases yeah. or songs that frank made popular that other people covered uh, again, being such a Francophile, I really urge not ev and everyone not just check out this record and please support this record for the charity element, but also, again, some of these tracks. Wave, to me, is a song. It's not often heard. It's not often done. And I think if, if you're really a fan of this music, that's going to blow people away when they hear that track. That's one of my favorite Sinatra songs of all time. I always picture uh, Sean Connery on a beach with a martini. You know, that's about the coolest song ever. So um, I almost I, I loved it so much. And I had I struggle hitting that low note, to be honest with you. It's uh, I've got to track that early in the day because at night, for some reason, those low notes do get uh, go away. But um, at the first show we do, I'm on the fence if I'm going to do that live or not. I think I'm going to use I'm going to leave it as an audible right before that song i'm gonna i'm gonna sing it to myself and if i can hit the note we'll do it <laughs> that's amazing my fingers are crossed for you man i, I think you. you can do it i know you can Thank uh, you. again like i said i could go on and on about how much this record is is really incredible and obviously the live thing is going to be a whole separate animal because live is a whole separate animal especially oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. with this style of music but yeah i, I might you know again it's just uh incredible this thing you're doing uh, you know, my fingers are crossed. We're going to do everything we can. We're going to link everything in the description where you have a review coming of the album. We'll run this interview. We're going to do everything we can on our end to help support you, support this amazing, amazing cause and this amazing project. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Yeah, of course. Uh, just a few last questions for you. I know you have to, you're heading into the studio. So you're in the studio making uh, a new Alter Bridge record. I don't know when you sleep, man. <laughs> I'm in the studio now. I just got off tour with Tremani um, uh, in the studio until the middle of next week. 
have the Sinatra show this weekend. And then uh, the 27th, the record comes out and I leave for Europe for another Tremonti tour. Uh, and then the Ultra Bridge record comes out October 14th. It's called uh, Pawns and Kings. Amazing. I'm so happy you're back on the road and I'm so excited for this Ultra Bridge record. And as a last question, of course, I have to ask the obligatory question. We're always asked by everybody all over the world. Will we get a Creed reunion at some point? Uh, you know, you, you never know. It's just one of those things where whenever it comes up, um, either either our camp or Scott has something going on at the moment. So it, our stars have to align. As, um, like right now, if a promoter said, hey, we want to do a huge Creed tour, I'd have to bypass all the stuff we're working on at the moment. So we just have to wait till the time's right. All right. Well, fingers crossed for you and Scott. And uh, we'll, keep, we'll keep hoping and keep hope alive. Mark, awesome. man, this has been really tremendous for me to chat with you, especially about this project and especially about what you have going on. Thank you so much for all you do. And thank you for thank hanging you. out with Ghost Cult. Thank you so much.